exploratory data analysis for correlated data. I'm going to kind of run through some things that maybe you haven't seen, haven't thought of, kind of been thinking about exploring the covariance structure in particular. And then tomorrow we're going to do kind of a case study. Okay, so I'm just going to walk through and kind of apply it as we go. But largely, lecture seven today will be a bit of a applied example as well. But we kind of put everything together tomorrow in terms of EDA and estimation to try and answer a particular scientific question as we go through. So that will be discussion. All right, so let's recap briefly what we did last time. So when we met last, we kind of started thinking about this correlated data problem where I'm thinking about a continuous response right now, right? So the natural way to go about that, I would say, given what we know, is to start off with weightedly squares. Just think about minimizing the sum of squared residuals. Do that in a weighted fashion, though, because you know you do not have homoscedastic disdi. In, in particular, you don't have kind of this nice diagonal that's running down the middle, right? You know that there's correlation floating around, largely due to the sampling designs that you would be working with. Data. Like, for example, you're measuring the same subject over and over again, you're measuring a classroom where you have clustering, you're measuring a family where individuals are related to one another, etc. Okay, so then we said, well, look, we know a lot about GLMs, and, and the reason that I do this is because this is where the stuff comes from. I mean, and sometimes students, you know, you kind of go and you look at this and you say, well, why would you start to get this? It's because what everything builds on what you know in the past. When we did GLMs, the reason I spent an entire lecture writing down the likelihood and then showing you guys that that became equivalent to iteratively related least squares was because I wanted you to get this concept of saying, yeah, you're just weighting by a variance. The variance is something that's a function of the mean. You don't know what the mean is, but you're building a model for it. And so therefore, you can take a fit from your model, plug it into the variance, reweight it, get new estimates, come back, do it again. And this, uh, this, this concept is very, very natural once you start to think about it that way. That again became our maximum likelihood estimates in the case of an exponential family model where we correctly specify that likelihood. So now that we're in this weighted least square setting where we've got some variance, variance covariance matrix sigma I've been calling it, that's sitting up here in the top, I talked about a very specific example here. I talked about the case where we were thinking about a complete and balanced design and where I had a common sigma across subjects, okay? So that's gonna be an n by n, little n by little n matrix variance covariance matrix. That's this guy sitting up here. And we said, well, look, we wanna find some quote unquote good estimating procedure for these betas that are here, let's think about a plug-in estimator for sigma where we simply take residual times residual transpose, do that for each subject, that's going to give me a little n by little n estimate of the variance covariance matrix on each subject, and then I'll just average across all of them. Again, I'm using that assumption that capital sigma does not depend upon I there. Okay? And we think, oh yeah, that's a, that's a great moment-based estimator, and that's because the method of moments are going to send that guy off to the true sigma, if that was a correct assumption, what I've got sitting up there. Okay. Again, this works in the, the balanced and complete case because I'm assuming the dimension of these things are, are the constant across everybody. All right, and so how can we then build that into an iterative procedure? Well, we can start off by simply saying, let me just go ahead and get a starting point for these betas. I will take that to be my OLS estimator. In other words, I'll take the independence, what we're going to call later on the working covariance matrix. I'll start off with something that's independent. Then from, from that, I get my estimates. Those are going to give me values of the residuals then, so I can now obtain a first value of my weight matrix here, sigma hat, or the inverse of my weight matrix, truly. And then using that guy, I can reiterate back into beta one hat, and then so on and so forth until convergence. And what I talked about last time was this is indeed the MLE. This will converge down to the MLE if you had multivariate normal data in a balanced and complete setting, where you have a common sigma. Okay? It's the maximum likelihood estimate. And you can kind of see that, right? Because this right here would be your MLE for the variance. Right there. Yeah. Right. So that works well there. The problem is, is we aren't always in a balanced and complete case, number one. No, 
Number two, we probably want to do some sort of data reduction on capital sigma. In other words, that's a lot of parameters to start estimating okay, as we're floating across this in byte in matrix. And so if we put structure on that, and what I told you guys last time to give you an example of this is to say, okay, now we're going to put structure on. That means simplifying assumptions. That means, again, if, 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 if you're a good applied statistician, in my opinion, you start thinking, yeah, and I'm probably wrong in the simplifying assumptions. So let's start thinking about what we're estimating now. Okay? So if I come through and I say, okay, well, let me just start off with a very, I would argue, the simplest correlation-based model, which is this compound symmetric model, okay? or an exchangeable, quote-unquote, correlation matrix, or covariance matrix, where I just assume that I now have a common variance for each of my observations. That theta 1 does not depend upon i, and it does not depend upon j. It says that my variance is common either within the subject for an observation or across subjects. And then finally, my covariance between any two observations being theta 2. In other words, I take any two observations on the same subject slash cluster slash sampling unit, however you want to, the terminology you want to use there, I have a common covariance, i.e., in this case, with this assumption sitting up here, I have a common correlation between those two observations. So from that, then, we can do the same trick that we had done before, but we won't use this very general kind of method of moments estimator where we estimate an in by n. What we'll do is we'll target each of those two parameters, right? So for theta 1 hat, I can say, oh, okay, well, that's the variance of any particular observation. I'll take the residual for any particular observation. I'll average them within the sampling unit. And then since I'm assuming that they're common across sampling units, I'll do that across all the sampling units. Very natural. The next is to say, now I need to estimate this covariance. Oh, well, OK. I'll take this thing has mean 0. This is my residual. So I'll take the residual for the jth measurement on the ith observation times the residual for the kth measurement on the ith, on the ith sorry, cluster. I've got n times n minus 1 of those pairs, not counting duplicates when I change ordering. So I'll take the average of all of them. And again, since I'm assuming that to be constant across sampling units, I'll average across all those samples. We're doing there. So very simple moment-based estimation. The beauty of that is that if we were right in that assumption, we know these things will be consistent for those parameters. Again, with very minimal assumptions on what's going on here. Okay? All right. And that's just we blow large numbers coming at us. Now, if we're wrong though, and many of you guys have already said, yeah, but that doesn't seem reasonable in a lot of cases. For example, if I'm measuring someone over time, I would expect two observations closer in time to have a higher correlation than two observations farther apart in time. Pretty natural to think about. Okay? So that would violate this compound symmetric assumption that I've got here. Similarly, I might have heteroscedasticity of cross measurements over time. For example, if you thought about a crossover design where at some certain point I implement a treatment, my variance might go up, right? So I wouldn't have a common variance coming down that diagonal. So it would be a common data one within inside of the subject. So lots of ways that this might be violated, might be violated practically. Okay. So then the question becomes, well, what do you estimate? Well, now your estimate looks like for data one, it's this average of what the variances are across the observations, and your estimate of theta two. It looks like this average of what the covariances would be. And again, they're all different values now. But that's what you're converging off to. That's what the weak law large number is going to tell you. Well, an extinction of the weak law large number is going to tell you that. So now, we've used this weight matrix. And if we go back to our previous theory, that means that our variance at the end of the day is going to look like an A inverse B, A inverse. It's not going to collapse down. It's not going to collapse we would have gotten that right if we would have specified the compound symmetric variance covariance matrix correctly. But now we're going to get this thing that's sandwiched in the middle for our B. Right? So this guy here no longer is the correct sigma that we had assumed, so we don't get cancellation here, which means that B is equal to A. We get this big fat sandwich that's sitting right upside of here. Okay? So N, A, and inverse, B, and A. And then we say, OK, well, I can do a couple of things, right? I could assume something for the variance of y. I could say, well, maybe I was wrong in my compound symmetric setting, so I'm going to assume that it was an AR1, an autoregressive 1 process, and plug that in there. I could get an estimate for that. 
plug it in there? Does that seem like a reasonable thing to do in practice? Francis says yes. Maricela says no. Fight it out. Francis is a very agreeable person. <laughs> yeah, Francis is a very agreeable person. Well, here's my answer to that. Is if I believed I had an AR1 structure to fix this thing up with, what would I do? I would have went back and just modeled it, right? I could have done the same thing with plug-in estimators on an AR1 structure, just taking pairwise uh, residuals and estimated my correlation on those pairwise residuals, and done the same thing, and then assumed that I was right at the end of the day. But guess what? If I was wrong then, I'd be right back in the same boat. I'd have an A in inverse, B in A in inverse, still sitting there with true variance of Y sitting in the middle there. You guys with me on this? So it comes down to saying, well, you can either make an assumption, go back to the Beatles example, right? I mean, I came down with the sandwich estimator and I said, look, there are a few ways we can handle this. We can either assume everything is independent and just go with whatever GLM family equals binomial tells us, dispersion parameter equal one. You know, that's the, uh, I don't care what the data tell me, I'm just going to go ahead and stick with my assumption to begin with because it's easy in life. There's two was we had a scalar over dispersed model. Scalar over dispersed model isn't going to really help you here anymore, right? You don't think that there's some constant that's hitting everything that's going off here. And it would have gotten sunken in, by the way, into theta 1 and theta 2 if you had. The third one that I had there was I said, well, you could assume a parametric model. That's what I just now talked to you guys about, right? I could have assumed a beta binomial model stuck in a, a, moment, a method of moment estimator inside of there. We did that last time for the Beatles example. But again, so that's so the analogy here, analogy example here would be to assume an AR1 structure. But again, if I wanted to assume that, just like with the Beatles example, I could have just fit that model. Start off with the model. So the fourth one was to say, well, we gave it our best whack. We assumed something like simple, that we could estimate two single parameters. We use that weighting as we go through to try and gain back a little bit of efficiency. You guys are looking at that, by the way, in your third and one problem. And so we could then say, well, what I'm going to do is I can just use an empirical estimate now of the variance covariance matrix. In other words, I will take my last bit of those guys, um, of those beta hats, derive my residuals, and estimate sigma hat observation that's sitting there. So last time in class, I won't, I won't write it down for you guys again, I wrote down what the in hat would be in that case for the empirical or robust variance estimator. It looked just like y minus x beta hat from the last residual times y minus x beta hat times. I'm sticking that thing in for this variance of y. Okay. Good. So, that then gives us a safety net. The nice thing about that last safety net is, again, you're back to an asymptotic consistency argument. You're saying that I know that those residuals squared to generate that last sigma hat squared will eventually converge off to the true variance. But you've got to have a larger sample size to get there. And you guys are going to look at that sample size a little bit more in your simulation in class. But usually, as you start getting into around the n equal to 100 range, you're doing pretty well there. I mean, it depends upon how many observations you have per cluster. And when I say n equal 100, I'm talking about independent clusters. Okay. Now, if you came to me and said, I've got n equal 100 independent clusters, but I've got 7,000 observations on each cluster, this isn't going to work so well. You guys with me? Because what am I trying to estimate at the end of the day? A 7,000 by 7,000 variance covariance matrix. And I'm going to be doing it on 100 observations, basically. So that's not going to work so well. So really what we're talking about is more of a longitudinal case where I'm saying 100 observations, usually like 7 to 10 observations on a cluster, this thing will work just fine. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question regarding um, when you said that when we use uh, a simple moment based estimator for our sigma on the, uh, for our theta on the diagonal, uh, yeah. that, that would basically average first the Denner group and then average um, between the groups, yeah. So why would uh, a simple moment-based estimator in this case not just give us the overall on average because if, if we have the same sigma on the diagonal. If you have the same sigma on the diagonal? Well, but we do have, right, uh, by our assumption. That's the assumption here. So this thing will converge to theta 1. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, but what, what I'm saying, why not just average all, like, just take a usual uh, variance? Why not just take a usual variance? Because I'm just trying to rewrite it for you. This is a usual variance. This is true. Everything is independent. Okay. 
that's exactly what it is. I'm just trying to illustrate for you that what I'm doing is I'm assuming the same thing within a subject and between subjects. That whole thing's just going to have to try it out. So, so the inner sum is a thousand threads, so it moves. Yeah. Oh. It's all, yeah. Bring this one over right now. You got one over capital n times little n. Yeah. Sum over all observations. That's all that that is. I'm rewriting it this way again to try and illustrate. It's, it's we call it pedagogy. Yeah. When you say that the learning observation is in a thousand in each learning cluster is in a thousand in SID, if you're saying it's like so well, are you saying computationally? What I'm saying in terms of it, its estimate of, let me bring it up. I'm saying when you plug in B in hat, which is just the UU transpar, the residual residual transpose. The estimate of this overall variance then is going to be erratic. In other words, it hasn't kind of settled down on average what's going on okay, in that case. And that's because in that case, I would have a 7,000 by 7,000 matrix in here. And then well, I would be averaging basically over only 100 observations. And so I would have, you know, so it's, a, it's a big P small n problem if you want in that case. Okay? So that's, that's what I mean by that. So again, this stuff works. Very, very well, and if you remember back the first day of class, I tried to describe for you kind of the difference largely between longitudinal data and time series data when we think about time, right? The idea behind longitudinal data is lots of independent clusters that you can borrow information off of with fewer numbers of observations to estimate those parameters. That's what I'm doing. Whereas time series data says, I've got usually one independent cluster, maybe a few, but a lot of repeated observations on it. And that's kind of the situation I just described. Now I have 100 unique uh, independent clusters, but 1,000, I, I think 7,000 observations on each one of them. Well, in that case, I have to rely upon some assumption of the structure of what that variance program is. I just I can't take a simple average across them anymore because I just don't have the number of observations to parameters in that data set. You guys with me on that? So, uh, yes. so, building on Mario's question, that yes. uh, the threshold that you put uh, for the variance estimator, yes. um, could you reword it in terms of like a ratio between the number of units and the number of observations per unit? Uh, yeah, I mean, so you want to kind of think about usually, oops, the setting that I would probably start thinking that this thing will start to converge down. And I want to be a little bit careful here, Sebastian, because it does depend a little bit on within versus between varying covariates as well. It turns out, you guys are going to look at this, by the way. But roughly kind of 10 to 1 is kind of where it starts to settle down and start to trust it a little bit more. And again, you guys will see, and, and when I make those types of statements, they're, 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 you know, when you deal with asymptotics, you don't generally have finite sample theory to deal with, you know, the main statements about, right? I mean, they're all asymptotic statements. So we say, well, how does it kind of work, right? It's just like when you think about teaching your stat seven folks or your, your very first statistics class, you tell them about the central limit theorem. And they say, well, when does it work? And what is your guys' answer for that? What is it? <laughs> yeah, well, in the limit, only in the limit. Yeah, and so in most textbooks will say, usually around a sample size of about 30. Well, there, there's no theory for that. So where do we get that number from? Yeah, exactly. Simulation, right? So as we go through, we, we look at finite simulation practice for this. Yes. Yeah, simulation is a good, uh, like, optimistic answer in this case because I, I think there is also started at some point the tables, like you, you calculated some results from, were just structured so that like when, when it's more than 30, it's just like difficult to calculate. Yeah. So this number actually originated somewhere at that time. So yeah. Well, I'm gonna refine the answer in just a second for you, but I'm not actually done with the story just yet. But yeah, go ahead. Oh, you can finish the story. Then. No, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say I thought it came from because um, only 30 rows were on this paper, and so. <laughs> so there are just logistics. Things. This may be, but it turns out, have you guys ever simulated just the normal approximation to the sample? Mm -hmm. And when does it start kicking in really well? Like, in other words, when did you apply, have you looked at the performance of just a, a single sample t-test when you have non-normally distributed data? I mean, the t-test was derived under normally distributed data, right? That's why Gossett derived it under. He said, okay, I've got truly independent, homoscedastic data. They're normally distributed. 
and you derive the t distribution. So this is correct. This is the exact distribution of set. How many of you guys have looked at the performance of the t test when the data are distributed? Gamma, exponential, whatever, log normal. Choose it. Yeah. Right. So when does it kick in and start working? So the one sample t test is pretty fast. Really fast. Like five to ten actually. Five to ten with almost good acid here. I mean, so, so, so that's my answer to folks. And, and how do I know that? Well, I know that through simulation. I don't know that through anything else. Okay, there's no theory that sits there and tells me that it's five to ten. But it actually does work. Now, I always tell people, though, the dangerous part is not the fact that the central limit theorem, or actually that is the dangerous part, that it works so well and kicks in so fast, because then people start to overinterpret their inference with five to ten observations, right? So you have to step back for a second and say, okay, the central limit theorem gives me this thing that gives me correct inference under a case where I can simulate it and I've got kind of a, a single distribution that I'm sampling from, whether it be exponential or gamma or whatever. But you always have to step back and ask yourself as a scientist, right? Everybody likes to use the term data scientist these days. Well, if you're a data scientist, you better stop back and ask yourself, well, now I'm going to try and make inference about an, a, a, an effectively infinite population and do that with a sample size of five. How do I know that it's not truly bimodal and I just didn't sample the other mode in my five observations that's coming from this infinite sample size of the decision, right? So it's, it's much more a scientific problem, I will argue at that point, than a central limit theorem type of problem. But it kicks in really fast for, for homogeneous data, in other words, um, almost fasting data. Okay. Um, so uh, I have heard the stories about the cage limits and, and tables cutting off, and that's where these things come from. But again, my dangerous answer to people is, yeah, like five to ten, usually the signals start kicking in real, real quick. Well, here, Sebastian, I'm giving you a very kind of rough estimate of about a ten to one, okay? And you guys are going to look at it a little bit more. And you can break that in different cases. If I start throwing huge heteroscedasticity at things, or start changing variables inside, that, that will break, I mean, Sebastian. Uh, Simulation is not, uh, <laughs> it's not exhaustive. Sebastian's probably not exhaustive either, but you know, simulation is not exhaustive as an approach. All right. Good. So that's what we're going to be converging on to. Of course, those things wouldn't be correct if our assumption about the compound symmetric isn't right. So we throw in our, our empirical variance estimator. That gets us back to something that at least is a consistent <laughs> estimator of what the true variance of those weighted beta hats are. Okay. Seem intuitive to you guys? Does it seem kind of like a reasonable thing to be doing now? I hope so, because that's the way I've been building this up since like 2.11 day one, okay? I mean, it, it, everything is following along exactly with what we did there. Exactly. Just now in the multivariate response. All right. So, where does that name, so now you've got like all these different names, right? You've got Huber White. The theory for this, the underlying theory for this really started with Huber White. So with Huber in the 60s, White did to because again, you can put this in the same context that White was dealing with. He's saying, oh, you start off with some multivariate normal where you assume that the variance covariance is compound symmetric. What are your estimators, your MLEs converge off to? They're out there. They converge off to this thing that's normal with variance, though, that now looks like an inverse PA inverse. Okay. Liang and Zager, these are two of the authors of your guys' textbook. So these folks. Effectively, their claim to fame, which was a great contribution, in fact, to statistics, they took kind of that white result and then said, well, let's take it to the multivariate correlated data case. Because white was really working in univariate data. Okay? He wasn't thinking about correlation between observations. But they were borrowing off of that underlying theory there. And so back in 86, that's where kind of the terminology, I told you guys there are like four names for this robust variance estimator. That's where the term robust came from, was back when they started coming out with different correlated data origin of these things. Before that, it was the empirical or Huber slash white. So now, some more terminology for you guys. That thing that I've been calling WI inverse, we tend to refer to that as the working covariance model. The reason why is it's a working covariance model because we're using it to gain estimates of beta hat, but we don't really believe it. I mean, that's, that's the underlying idea. And at the end of the day, we'll fix up the variances. So, and then finally, I mentioned this last time, but what we're talking about here is a small example, the simplest, I would argue, example of a much larger class of estimators called generalized estimating equations, okay? 
we started off with a weight of these squares estimating equation here and then fixed up the variance at the end of the day. This terminology, generalized estimating equations, comes from these two folks here, Lee and Zager, in their 86 paper. Yeah. And so we're going to build on this. We've been dealing with a linear estimating equation, a weighted least squares estimating equation. The generalized part is because we're going to put in a least function, okay, pretty soon, just like a GLM. Uh, now, one final thing. Inference in this case, suppose you wanted to test either a single beta, in which case I can take this L to be just a vector, or say L transpose being a row vector with all zeros and then a single one in one of those elements, that would test a single beta, or I might want to take a linear combination of these guys and create a contrast matrix that's sitting up there. Well, if I want to perform that hypothesis test, Oh, well, we've got some theory now, right? So we know that root n times L transpose beta hat is going to converge off to a normal. That's just a linear transformation. Now the variance is going to be L transpose C times L. That's great. So now I know what the approximate distribution is of that contrast matrix times my unknown parameters. From that, then, I can formulate a usual Walt statistic, right? I can take estimate under the null inverse of the variance, covariance matrix, estimate under the null, right? Transpose on the other side. This guy here, what am I missing down here? I have a little d, which is correct. That thing does converge off in distribution of this pi square with two degrees of freedom, but what else do I need? What is it? Well, that's what that means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about a Walt statistic, right? What do we know the usual case for the aspect distribution of the Walt statistic under? What am I assuming when I write this down? So there's implicitly an L transpose beta hat minus zero under HO, right? This is true under HO, so write it under HO there. Okay? I'm assuming that I'm centering this thing correctly. In my case, I'm, I'm putting on, I'm testing a null hypothesis without zero, so it just disappears there. Okay. Put it under each other. So that will get you inference about linear combinations of betas. That's what we want. We've seen this before, though, right? I think it was Sebastian that actually brought this up last time. No more likely the ratio test, though, right? In other words, when I come to the end of this process and I say, I don't know what the true variance of the y's are, that means I don't know what the distribution of the y's are. And so, therefore, I'm doing an empirical estimate on them. If I don't know the true distribution of those guys, then I don't have a likelihood for me to likely the ratio test for them anymore, right? So I'm stuck with first and second moments of that estimator or the linear combination of that estimator, okay? There's a subset of variables. What a like? How would it proceed? If you needed to test a subset of variables, you'd specify that L contrast. Here, let's write it down. Oh, good. Yeah, I see. This is make sure we're on the same page here. And this, by the way, is. Part of the reason why I had you guys last quarter write your own function for a multivariate log test. Okay? You're going to be using it again here, and now you're going to do it in the correlated data case. So suppose that my model looked like expectation of yi equaling xi beta so that expectation of yij, for example, look like beta naught plus beta 1 xi1 plus dot 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 plus beta p minus 1 xi sub p minus 1. So, the way the fitting procedure would work is you'd say, okay, I'm going to assume a working covariance structure for my response yi. And the 
example that I just gave, my assumed working covariance structure was the compound symmetric working covariance structure. I would then implement the iteratively review and least squares process using the residuals from the previous iteration sigma i star as my working covariance structure. I'm going to call it star right now. Just to make sure that it's working. You understand that. Then I would obtain Right, so this thing's going to run through. You're going to be looking at whether beta hat is changing as you're plugging in new weights. You'll obtain your final estimates of beta hat after convergence. Okay. So now, a classic way to do this is to say, now I'm going to estimate the variance of beta hat with the, ro the robust variance estimator, that's the plug-in of the residuals inside of the sandwich that I wrote down in last class. So call this thing Variance hat robust, if you want, a beta hat sigma so star. And now, suppose that I want to test HO that beta 2 is equal to beta 4, I don't want to get too carried away, is equal to 0. Okay, so Simultaneous test of two parameters inside my model. I want to test two things at the same time. In this case, what I would do then is I would define L to have a zero in the first element, a zero in the second element, a one, a zero, a one and then zero all the way down. So again, this would correspond to beta zero, beta one, there's beta two, beta three, beta four. You guys with me? Yeah? Okay. Then I would formulate my contrast. I want, to, I want a matrix there. Okay, thank you. So this would test beta 1 plus beta 4, right? The linear combination. Sorry about that. Easily fixed. Easily fixed. Sound good? Okay. So now if I test that guy, that's a simultaneous test of that's, that's beta 3. There we go. How's that? Did I, did I match those things up right? I think I matched those up right now. A beta 2 equaling 0 and beta 4 equaling 0. And so now, this guy is going to be approximately normally distributed with mean L transpose beta 
and then variance L transpose variance hat robust beta hat sigma star times L. Okay, so far so good. And I can carry out that test then. So then I can formulate Wald stat is now going to look like, let's see, I'm testing this L transpose beta equaling to the zero matrix. So it's going to look like L transpose beta inverse of this guy combination, that was my next example anyways, I would just take my one where I wrote one of those linear combinations off of me, right? Or put in any coefficients that I want on it. That's like, okay. So the key thing here is again, you're left with the wall statistic. Okay? And in other words, if you want to do inference in this case, there isn't a likelihood to borrow the information off of to say, I'm going to do a likelihood ratio test. Now, I taught you guys to kind of cheat a little bit in the GLM case to still do a likelihood ratio test, a goodness of the likelihood ratio test. What was one way you could get at that by saying, I think I got the variance wrong, but I'm going to kind of fix up my deviance likelihood ratio test. How do we do that there? Taking you back, I know it's, it feels like an eternity. It was at least week three. Remember, for an exponential family model back in the GLM case, if I assume that I was just off by a scalar in my variance, in other words, a phi, how could I fix up the likelihood ratio test? Can you just divide it by squares? Uh, I can just divide it by phi, right? I can divide it by my Pearson estimate of that thing, because it all carried through the log likelihood. You guys remember that? If not, remind yourselves, go back and write down the log likelihood. That phi just carries right through on everything. It's just in the denominator. So when you wrote down the likelihood ratio test statistic, you just divide it by phi. So it was like, a simple fix, if you will, on the likelihood ratio test to say, I just need to scale it back. Okay? Now, you did that a couple of times in the goodness of fit testing case against the saturated model. Here, you can't really get away with that anymore. I mean, it's, you're not off by a constant phi. There's a big variance covariance matrix that's sitting there. It's not like at some simple scalar you're going to be able to just divide through. And in fact, your model would have picked it up already with the method of moments estimators that we had if you were just off by phi. It would have estimated that. So, we are left with wall based inter uh, inference. Okay. Not so bad, it's not the end of the world, we can still do inference, it's just we can't be likely to ratio based inference. Good. Everybody alright? Yeah. The beta is in your one side on the left side, half the sigma at the bottom. What was that now? The beta is in the one side of your wall side. Oh! I'm just trying to continually emphasize, right, that there was this weighting that was going on that we had assumed. That's why I'm not writing this down. This thing is derived by some working programs where you've got sitting down the Good, good. 
You guys also have the luxury, by the way, of just sitting here. So, so Arnie's question was, well, look, now you just told us that we don't have a likelihood to base inference on. And so now if I wanted to do a goodness of fit test for these type of data, how would I do that? Because what you taught us before was we would use the deviance goodness of fit test, and that's a likelihood of ratio test, ratio test, right, against the saturated model. So it's a great question. Well, there was a case where you did not have that luxury. We used Hosmer and Limeshaw back in the binary data case, right? And that's because we had degeneracy and the likelihood under the saturated model. So we couldn't get a good approximation of that thing. So think back about what is more, it, it, so you wouldn't use what people would call, it wouldn't refer to it as a Hosmer and Limeshaw goodness of fit test here. But you could do something similar in that, what did Hosmer and Limeshaw really do? I mean, you just think, just think intuitively about what they were doing. It was a very intuitive procedure. So what they said was, they said, look, I can take observed fits, right? Once I collapse things down into like groups, people have the same, a similar propensity for having a success, if you will, in the binary data case. And I can take an expected count from my model, say how many, how many successes should I have seen based upon my model, and I can take the, a contrast with those things. I can take the difference, observed minus expected, square that thing, and then they kind of standardize it. Well, what would be the analogy of what they're doing here? I mean, you're out here without a likelihood. What would be the analogy for the continuous data case? Probably wouldn't be the collapsing, because we used the collapsing there because we had zero one. So we need to borrow information. The, 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 the analogy here, what's it? Maybe looking at the sums of squared residuals, right? Which would get you back to effectively your likelihood, your log likelihood for the normal model, right? Which is going to be the sum of squared residuals at the end of the day. So the problem is you don't have any theory to standardize it. So people still do look at their sums of squared residuals to compare across models. But then you run into the problems like we've had with prediction where you can maybe do overfitting, for example. And so as you're starting to rank models and do these things, um, you run into the problem saying, well, I could fit the observed data perfectly, which is my observed mean squared error. And so, so most people then, if you're really concerned about goodness of fit tests in this case, you kind of work into more of a prediction model assessment and say, avoid overfitting and see how, well, how far your model is off in terms of mean squared error from, say, an optimally chosen predictive model. Okay. Um, now, I have to admit, Arnie, in asking that question, this kind of framework where you say, look, I really care about that scientific question identified by Xi beta, it's kind of specified already. So the goodness of fit concept becomes a little like, okay, well, you wouldn't really change your model because you've got a particular question in mind and you're trying to draw inference on it. And so it becomes a bit of a misnomer to some degree. But if you wanted to do it, you'd probably go to more of a prediction assessment. Not a singular. That's a great question. Good, good, good. Um, all right, any other? Okay, so now with all of this in mind, just to kind of give you guys a little bit of motivation on where you are um, for the homework. So in problem number three of the homework, I'm asking you guys to look at the relative efficiency of different weighting schemes, okay? So you are gonna generate data under a particular known weighting scheme, and I'm asking you to fit two alternate weighting schemes as well, and we'll say, what is the variance of my estimators? You're going to see very quickly that they're all unbiased, at least in the in the complete data case. There's, something, there's another surprise waiting for you later on that problem. But in the complete data case, they're all going to be unbiased. But when you put different weights on those things, you'll see that the variance is going to change, the true variance of those estimates. Okay, so your efficiency will change. And so now, 
what we want to do is I spent the previous lecture, lecture five, talking about different variance covariance models we might assume. In this particular case, I'm showing you something you guys can't see. In the, in the particular example I gave you, I said let's just assume a compound symmetric. But if we could somehow do some descriptive statistics to say, well, maybe it's better characterized by some autoregressive process, then we probably want to go with that for our working variance covariance matrix because that's going to get us closer to the true sigma. And being closer to the true sigma will ultimately get us a more efficient estimator. You guys with me? It's the same principle that we had way back in the PLM case. So now as we go into lecture seven, the idea here is to think about descriptive statistics or exploratory data analysis for the covariance model. So let's go ahead and move on to lecture seven. Does anybody need a lecture seven? I know some people did not get one last time. A couple people. I've got, I've got three more if anybody needs them. It's coming. Can you, can you hand back our seat? Sorry, I'm in for two of those. As we go through, this is really going to be more for the mean model, so to speak. In other words, the X beta portion of our model is the systematic component. But then I'm going to start to emphasize a little bit of the quote unquote empirical covariance that we can derive off of the data. We're going to look at something called a residual pairs plots, a standard deviation plot, and then finally, something I find fairly useful is something called a variogram. Okay, so a variogram is going to be to try and diagnose a variance structure. <coughs> So, throughout this particular lecture, I'm going to focus on that max uh, CD4 data set that I introduced earlier. So, the max data, if you recall, consisted of 369 units, so you can think about 369 independent sampling units. And those men were sampled from a high-risk STD clinic, and they had their CD4 counts longitudinally measured over time approximately every year, okay? And so there are measurements both before and after those individuals contracted the HIV virus. And so we call that time of contraction zero conversion. And by the way, everybody here had zero conversion. In other words, they all contracted HIV, so all 369 at some point contracted HIV. Again, part of this particular study was to say we want to learn a little bit more about the natural history of HIV disease. In other words, what should we expect in terms of CD4 depletion in individuals? You want to think about a baseline because ultimately targeted therapies are going to try and increase the CD4 counts once somebody zero converts. Okay, so you want to start thinking about, well, what happens in the absence of any treatment on these individuals? This is in the early days, by the way. Okay, and so just a little bit more for you guys. CD4, you know, that, that's basically drives your immune system. So what happens is the HIV virus mutates, your CD4 counts get depleted, you can't fight off infection. That's, that's the whole um, terribleness of the disease, if you will. Okay. So, oh, I said a year, I'm sorry, every six months. So I apologize about that. Approximately every six months, not every year. Um, so total number of observations that we have, about 2,400, okay, across the 369 individuals. Okay. So some of the data that you guys have at your disposal, disposer, disposal, if I can get that out, is time since zero conversion. Okay, so that's gonna, we're gonna have negative times and we're gonna have positive times because people were followed before zero conversion. So if you get a negative one, that's gonna mean one year prior to zero conversion. Okay. 
We also have the CD4 count, that's going to be the outcome of interest. We're going to have age, and that's relative to an arbitrary origin. So this is commonly done in data sets where you work with human beings because you want to have de-identified data. So basically it's going to be their age relative to some arbitrary date, like January 1st, 1960 or something like that. So everybody gets a shift. The packs of cigarettes smoked per day, recreational drug use, number of sexual partners that they had reported at any given point in time, something called a mental illness score, CESD, and then finally their subject ID. And again, part of the data that's here was to say, do these factors impact the natural history of CD4 counts in some way as we're going through? Or do CD4 counts impact some of the others, for example, the mental illness score you can imagine? All right. So what we're going to do is consider these longitudinal changes of CD4 within subjects and depletion after HIV, ultimately. So I showed you guys this last time. This is actually a scatter plot of the data, right? So each data, each point here represents a single observation on a sampling unit on an individual. And what I have coming through here is just a basically a running average. It's a smoothing spline running average here. And so let me just jump into R and kind of show you where I'm at here. So if you pull the quote. A couple of things for you guys when you pull this. I'm going to use two packages. I'm going to use the survival package. I'm going to use the spline package. I need functions from those things. So if you're saying Dylan's code doesn't work, it may be because you didn't read those two libraries. In. Okay. So make sure that those guys are in. Okay. So a quick summary of the data here. So this guy is going to be largely useless. Why do I say that this guy is going to be largely useless if I just type in summary of CD4 counts? Certain things are going to be obviously useless. So this is the classic one that I was talking to you guys about. Don't give me that when I recall my exam. That's, that's like instant bell. <laughs> yeah, so these are not balanced and complete data. These are humans in an observational setting. Okay? Some people you're going to see very quickly are going to come back four times, some people two times, some people nine times okay, as they're going through. When I look at these things and I look at something like the mean age, what's going on there? That's the mean age across all of their visits, right? So I'm putting higher weight on individuals that came back nine times and came back two times. So what would you want for descriptive statistics? that, or what I would want to do is I would want to take unique individuals and report the mean age across individuals in my study, the 369 men inside of my study, for example, right? Okay, so as you're doing this, you've got to just think about the fact that the age is going to be pulled by individuals that were measured more often, came back more. That's similarly true for the CD4 counts though, right? The more somebody comes back, the more CD4 measurements they have, the more they're going to add into that simple average. R is not thinking about the fact that you've got clusters here. Okay. Would you, so if you're looking at individuals, would you just take the base of it? Would you take it as a standard conversion? Yeah, so in this particular case, it would probably be zero conversion, because that's kind of the time at which I'm anchoring folks to, right? So that would be the scientifically most meaningful thing to do, is take their age at time of zero conversion. Okay. I'm going to use this a lot, but I'll show you guys right now. For the trick, this is not written into your, it, it, is, it is kind of scattered throughout the code that you guys have in your handouts and I have online. But you will find this to be very nice. So the split function, for those of you guys that have not used it, how many people have used the split function in here? Two of you guys. It's going to become your best friend for correlated data for repeated measures, okay? So if I take split CD4, for example, that's the name of my data set. Let me try and bring this up for you guys so you can see it. Make sure it's high. It's not high. And I split that by CD4 dollar sign ID. What that's going to do is it will take my data set and it will split it by each individual subject. And it will create a list. Okay, so each element of that list inside of R now is a unique subject. So this is subject 41844. Those are the years that they were measured at, and that was their age that's sitting there. Notice that it's repeated. This is what I was talking about before. It's their age at a particular visit, 
anchor to origin. That age, by the way, Arnie, is actually age at zero conversion. That's the way it's defined. Okay. So now, if I wanted to produce a meaningful summary measure of that, of say, age in my data set across unique subjects, well, split gives me back a list. So I can do L apply, that means list apply. That means I want to take a function and I want to apply that function to each element of my list. And yes? I was a little bit confused about the age coding. So let's say we said that zero is the time of zero conversion, right? It's our age at zero conversion, but then it's relative to an arbitrary origin date. Okay, but how, how come this person has like many observations of the same age? So it's like Say many times because it's their age at the time of zero conversion. They zero convert one time. Oh, okay. The year is the follow up. Pre, pre zero conversion, post zero conversion. But the age is their age at a specific, specific point in time for them, and that is the time that they can think about it as contracted HIV. That would be kind of the easiest way to think about it. And then it's, a, it's this odd minus 5.04 because, again, everybody got shifted relative to an arbitrary time margin. So it's a constant shift. So in other words, if you see somebody that has a minus four here, that means that this person was one year younger than that individual. You guys with me? We do the arbitrary shift because we want to identify the data. In other words, you don't want to be able to point somebody and say they're 43 point seven years old. You should go back and figure out what their birthday is. Okay. You guys with me? Yeah. Okay. So now we have got this split list split by each of my individual patients. So if I wanted to now pull off, say, unique age, I could do that by simply applying a function to each element of that list. So hopefully you guys have some paper down. Again, you'll see some examples as I go through doing this. It's a very common type of technique. But you could put in effectively, since this is time invariant, you can put in essentially any function you want. I can take the mean, I can take the minimum, I can take the maximum, I can take the exact same value coming back from that. In this particular case, I'll simply take the minimum. And when I do that, I'll leave it defined as uh, but I'm gonna change this in just one second. If you look at u.h now, it gives me back a list and it takes the minimum value of age from each one of those particular uh, elements of the list. Okay, so this was the last element that we were looking at. This is the person that was minus 5.04 for their age at time of zero conversion. Now, you ultimately, though, don't want that as a list because you want to apply functions to it. So now you want to unlist it. And if you unlist it, that'll give you just back a numeric vector again. Okay? And that's what you normally want to be looking at. So now if I look at u.age, I now have just a numeric vector of those individual ages, right? So now these are unique ages across my subjects. So now, a much more meaningful summary measure now of age in my district, in my data set is going to be the summary of those individual unique so now, Arnie, so now I can sit there and say, okay, at the time of zero conversion, the average age of individuals in my data says approximately minus 5.4 years. You guys with me? Or I could not say that about the previous summary. All right? So when you are thinking about summarizing correlated data, repeated measures data, think on the individual sampling unit, the independent sampling unit scale. Okay? okay. All right. Good, good, good. Everybody okay? Yeah, fine, so. How did you get age? Because you didn't type an age. What's that now? How did you get age? Because you didn't type an age at all. You just have split CD4 and CD4 or everything. Oh, that's a very good. Uh, <laughs> it actually does pull the age because those are the minimum values that are in there. Hold on. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, this is what happens when I do things on the fly for you guys, right? The better way to done this. Well, let's, let's, see how, let's see how different it was. So now I'm just splitting age, right? So note what I did here. When I do this split, so previously I wanted to show you the entire data set. But if I now just split age, you just get the ages across those individuals. Okay. Thanks, Monty. So.
Now let's see how much of a difference it actually made. <laughs> so you, you got me. Thank you. Uh, so what I was doing before you guys, this is what money still just caught, right? What I was doing before was taking for each, oh, I can't do that. When I split my data set before, I, because I wanted to show you guys a nifty example of just splitting up the whole data set. I had chunks, right? And when I applied the minimum to this, it just took the minimum across everything. It gave me back the minimum, not just the minimum age. So I just needed to split it back. Thank you, myself. It just so happened that in my little example here, minus 5.04, so you didn't, it didn't allow me to catch. That was the minimum value in that entire data set. So it's like, yeah. And all, all the people that were older than that, their yeah, negative exactly. years what came out, so you couldn't tell. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay, so split is your friend, okay? So again, you use it often. I'll be using it a lot in this lecture as well. Okay, so let me jump back to notes just to make sure that I'm on pace here. Um, so some simple descriptive statistics, again, that I would want to be doing here. Again, I talked about the summary measure. This isn't going to be very meaningful for us, so that should be your big note on this page. I put it in here just to, to highlight that point. Okay. Now, what does become meaningful, though, is thinking about the number of subjects and the number of observations per subject. So let me jump back in here. So a couple of things that I'm doing. So first of all, the paste is just so that I can kind of print things up so you guys can see what's going on here, right? But really, the key thing here is that I'm taking the length of tabling the ID. That's giving me the unique number of IDs. There are a million ways to do this, by the way. I could have used the unique function and then counted the length of that on the IDs. I find table to be pretty easy, though, because that's just going to simply give me back a table of IDs, and how each, each element of that table then is going to be an individual person. So now I take the length of it. So there are 369 individuals. Again, if I think about the total number of observations, that's just the length of the variable ID. That's not missing for anybody. It's always there, and so I don't take that value. Now, key to us is going to be tabling the table of IDs. And what I mean by that is if you look at a table of IDs, that's for each ID now on an individual. You can see that last person we were talking about there, 41844, they had six observations. The person before them had nine observations. If you want to know quickly how many observations you have across individuals, table that particular table, right? So what I'm going to do here is apply table twice on ID. And that'll say, OK, great. I've got 12 individuals. Or 10 individuals, I'm sorry, for which I have 12 observations, 23 individuals for which I have 11 observations, etc. You guys with me? Yeah. All right. So absolutely critical to lay that out. The reason why is because if I'm thinking about natural history of HIV, I'm thinking about trajectories and modeling within subject trajectories. These individuals that are over here with one and two observations aren't going to give me much information. Okay? So I got to let people know where my information is coming and how imbalanced it is, right? I mean, if I've got one person that has 1,200 observations and everybody else has 10, that person with 1,200 observations could potentially get a lot of weight in my analysis, depending upon the correlation structure I choose. Okay. All right. Good. So now, let's think a little bit about the mean model. Again, if you were just trying to explain to individuals what's going on marginally over time, we'll think about the cross-sectional mean now of CD4. So for this, I'll often give forward, or put forward just an average of cross-sectional running mean. Okay? So in my case, I'm going to use a smoothing spline. For those of you guys that don't know what a smoothing spline is, it's analogous to just that running average local smoother that I had. It's done in a different way, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it during one of our discussions to give you guys a little bit more intuition on what a smoothing spline is. But um, 
and it's done in an analogous way to kind of think about it as a running average as a function of time, so a non-parametric or flexible fit. So what I'm doing here is I'm smoothing the CD4 counts as a function of years. So in other words, the time is in zero conversion. Okay. So I'm going to start off by plotting each of them. So the degrees of freedom define, you can think about degrees of freedom like the number of parameters in the mean model. So I'm putting like a polynomial on this guy. Okay, so, that it, so it's like fitting a function of time where I have seven parameters to do that. That's the most intuitive way to think about this. And so as I change, as I increase that degrees of freedom, Francis, my fit is gonna become more flexible. If I let the degrees of freedom basically go off to 2300, I'll be fitting every data point individually. Think about it like that, okay? And as I bring that degrees of freedom down to one, I'll get a flat line, right? It'll just be like fitting an intercept. So just the average over everybody, okay? So in general, if you wanted to do this, you might think about something like cross-validation or AIC to choose that degree of freedom. If you're really wanting to spend a lot of time, what I'm trying to do is get a very quick, down and dirty, descriptive stat of what's going on about the CD4 counts as a function of time. So that's the plot that you guys have there. So a couple of things that you see, right? So zero is the time on zero conversion that's sitting here. And you see individuals basically as you're coming through, you see their CD4 accounts cross-sectionally start to drop at that time. Yes. Yeah, what are these uh, vertical clusters? So the vertical clusters are plus or minus six months okay, on individuals. And then what happens is we don't really know when somebody zero converted, right? So they came back, so they were here, and then they came back six months later approximately. And we see that their CD4 count changed a lot, and they now test positive for HIV. So what would you take then as their time of zero conversion? Sure, take the average, take the middle. So that's what you're seeing for the big change point in seven. <laughs> that's the plus or minus six months. Yeah. Yeah. Is the zero the arbitrary order? No, not on each. No, that's like a, that's like an actual date, right? So it's like again, it's like January first, nineteen sixty. Okay. Zero here is meaningful to us, our friends. It's subject specific. My zero and your zero are the, the times at which we zero converted. Okay? Okay. Okay. Yes. What mechanism was in place that where they would say, okay, in six months you have to come back and like what the dictated the frequency of they Did asked. you see okay they asked they asked them. Gotcha. Okay. So they enroll patients. So again this was a high risk S T D clinic. They said, look, we're going to start a, a study, basically, where we want to start following individual CD4 counts. And we would like you to enroll in the study. Part of the study is to come back every six months into the clinic. You get health care when you come back. But we also want to be able to measure your serum levels. So I, I'm just curious by, about the structure around that zero point. So the structure around that zero point is, again, the reason why this one looks so much more well-defined than all the others yeah. is because you know, there's an approximate six months for individuals, and they take the midpoint for the time of zero so you don't get, you don't get the values in between. What you're seeing on the scatter across these other things, though, are multiple types of individuals, right? So there's, yeah. these are different people kind of being randomly measured. Okay. Okay. So now, let's go to, that's the mean on these folks. And that's, again, the cross-sectional trends in what's happening. now. We've talked a little bit already, you guys are working on homework about the difference between the cross-sectional average of what we might be seeing in the population versus the within subject changes, right? And those two things may not necessarily coincide with one another. Um, so now let's look at an, an example of the within subject change in trajectories of CD4 counts relative to time of zero conversion. Actually, I'm going to read the plot.
So these are within subject changes in trajectories of CD4. These are going to look slightly different than what you guys have on your slides, and that's because I've just taken a true random sample here. I didn't set a seed or anything like that, okay? So I'm just pulling 25 subjects randomly. So a couple of things that we see here. One is what is happening in general. So do, do things kind of match up with what we see on the cross-sectional effect of CD4 counts relative to zero conversion? What I mean by that is the direction of the CD4 counts. Yeah, so within subject, people tend to be going down, right? This is different from the example that I gave you previously where I talked about FEV, where you could have cross-sectional effects looking like they're rising with age, but then within subject effects kind of going down. So a couple of things here. One is that we do get this kind of trend where folks start to be going down. It's hard to see on these types of plots, and this is only with 25 individuals, but you see a couple of other things. One is that there tends to be a lot of, of measurement error or randomness in CD4 counts, right? I mean, people are bouncing up and down. You don't expect people that have contracted HIV, like this individual here, to have their CD4s rising. There's a lot of measurement there in CD4 counts. It's sampling, basically. They're trying to count cells inside of the serum as you're going through it. So there's going to be error in that process. So that's another thing to take home here. Another thing is if you look at time zero, and you kind of think vertically about the variation that's going on there, does it look like there's random intercepts if I took my origin to be time zero, the time of zero conversion? Please say yes, right? People vary in terms of their CD4 counts from 500 to 2,000. That's what you're seeing just on this random size of 2,000. And then not everybody's starting off with a CD4 count of 750. You guys with me? But there's definitely random intercepts if I'm thinking about here at time zero. Some people tend to be high, some people are going to tend to be low in terms of where they are. Okay? And then finally, you can see some hints, anyways of like a serial process or a random slope, right? And so what I mean by that is there are some individuals, like this individual here, that's kind of going along and they're great, and then they start to drop rapidly, whereas you get other individuals that are kind of just moving along and they're continually kind of progressing down as a function of time. And then you get odd individuals up here that seem to be kind of moving along and then even rising, right? So that person that's up there, it almost makes you wonder whether they truly zero converted or not, right? When you look at that plot. Because they're kind of moving along just the way they were before. Okay. So that's some of the take-home messages that we have there. Now, going back to the cross-sectional effect, one thing I'll often do too, many of you guys do as well, is we plotted the smoothing spline, which is basically the running average. I might also want to think about running quantiles, right? So if I think about a skewed distribution of CD4, well, CD4 will be skewed. Some people are going to have very high CD4 counts and they're going to drive up the mean, okay, cross-sectional. So my code here just simply takes, creates a time vector. It's just running from minus 2.5 to 4.5, again, thinking about relative to the time of zero conversion. Then I'm going to create vectors that are going to be the first quantile, the median, and the third quantile. So all I'm doing is I'm going through and I'm saying for each time point, I want to take all the observations that are plus or minus six months to that time point. Then I want to compute the 25th percentile, 50th percentile, and 75th percentile. Okay, so I'm just holding those things inside of a vector. And then I'm going to plot them on top of the scatter plot. So when you do that, so that's just now a running, if you will. So, so you can think of the smoothing spline as a running mean as I'm going through. Now I simply have a running median, 25th percentile, 75th percentile of my data, okay? just to be able to visualize again what's going on. And if you wanted to illustrate to somebody the skewness of the data, one thing you might do is run the money, put the money running mean right back on there. Right? So I'll just do my smoothing splines again. Add that back on top. So that green line now is my running mean, basically, as you might think about it. The red line is my running median as I'm kind of going through these data, right? So again, these are cross-sectional. And again, the fact that the green line is consistently above the red line kind of telling me that I'm skewed to the left, right? So I have these high outline values on the, on the, on the larger side. So not a huge skewness here, but again, 
again, illustrative of the, of the issues. Okay. So we're going to pick up next time. We'll talk about EDA for the program structure. We already started a little bit with the random intercepts and the random slopes, but we'll get much more into that tomorrow.